Hi everyone. We're just going to give a couple more minutes as people are continuing to come into the conversation um, and join the meeting here. While we're waiting for people to join, I just want to take a moment, welcome everybody here and let you know that we are happy to answer questions throughout the presentation for you to be able to ask your questions. If you move your mouse in the upper right hand corner of the screen, you should see two little bubbles with a question mark in it. If you click that, it will open a chat box on the side. You can enter any questions you have in that chat box and we will either answer them live as we go or we will answer them towards the end. Please feel free to ask any questions you want. Also, we are going to do a recording of this with the, and send it out after. So if you'd like to add your email into the chat box, you can do that as well. Your email will not be posted and public for everybody to see as the moderator will control who sees everything. So feel free to ask questions. Again, using those two little um, bubbles at the top of your screen with the question mark. And we will start in just a moment as people are joining in. All right, so let's get started. Our agenda for this evening, we're just going to take a moment, introduce you to the Kilgore Group, who we are and what we do. Um, we will walk you through estate planning components and some of the basics of estate planning and then spend some time on death and taxes and what exactly that looks like using some examples to really help explain and have that make sense. Um, and then that will be followed up with Linda Laxo answering any questions you have and giving us a little bit more information on estates from a legal perspective. So we're very excited to have her with us as well tonight. Again, happy to answer questions throughout. Please feel free to enter them as you go. So who are we? We are the Kilgore Group and we provide wealth planning and wealth management services. So what does that mean? It means that we use our expertise to implement recommendations regarding strategic investment planning, tax planning, risk mitigation, and of course, intergenerational wealth transfer and estate planning, which is what we're here to focus on tonight. Our passion is working with clients to optimize their financial life. Our goal is to create peace of mind for you around your financial plan, support you through critical financial events, and be proactive in all aspects that improve your financial position. My name is Lindsay Kilgore. I am Senior Executive uh, Financial Consultant with the Kilgore Group at Investors Group Securities, Inc. I have been with Investors Group since 2009 um, when I graduated from McMaster University. I completed my certified financial planner designation in 2012 where I was able to join the president's list which was a great honor for having the second highest score in the country. I've continued to increase my knowledge and um, really have a thirst for learning new things and I'm currently working on my master financial advisor in philanthropy. Um, I am very lucky to be supported by an incredible team, both here locally and at our head office. We have Aaron and Chandra, who are both client facing here in Sudbury, as well as top experts on our financial planning team, including lawyers, accountants, CFAs, and financial analysts. So very happy with that. Um, what we believe in and what we do is full financial planning, making sure that we look at all aspects of a financial plan. Tonight our focus is on estate planning because I really do believe that no financial plan is complete without having an estate plan. So let's jump into some of the basics of estate planning and just some of the things you need to look at from the top. First of all, a will. A will is the centerpiece of your estate plan. You absolutely need one. It is the document that dictates your wishes for your estate after you pass. Now it's important to note that a will deals with the estate. There are many things that do not pass through the estate. They pass outside the estate, such as accounts with named beneficiaries. So we're gonna go through that, but the will is still very, very important. It dictates things such as who your executors are, who gets your assets, guardianship of children, trustees um, for money that are left to those children. And it's really important to note that there are a lot of pieces to that. For example, the guardian of your children may not be the person you trust to deal with the money. So it's really important to have all those things really baked in and a will that handles those things for you. Um, the first thing I mentioned is your executors. That is one of the first things that will be named on your will. And you have to make sure the person you choose is really up to doing that job. There's a few different details um, when you're choosing an executor. First and foremost, make sure they're a Canadian resident, preferably one in Ontario where you reside. I'm not gonna get too far into this as I'm gonna let Linda answer some specifics on this because this is her expertise, but I really wanted to just point that out. Um, 
also not going to get too too in depth on this because again this is Linda's area of expertise but wanted to touch base on the fact that when you're setting up a will it's important to make sure that it is customized to you and that you have a will that deals with what you need so that could be things like beneficiaries and guardians for young children it could also be having beneficiaries um, with special needs and making sure that you have things like Henson Trust set up if you have a beneficiary who may have special needs so that your inheritance being left to them doesn't claw back government subsidies and ODSP and things that they can get. So again, these are all little nuances that it's really important to go through and make sure that the will reflects your needs. Um, something that is not part of the will, but I wanted to bring up as it is extremely important as well, is having a power of attorney and having a power of attorney for both health and finance. Now, again, it's not part of the will, but most people do get these drawn up at the same time. And it's very important to have. Also important to make sure it's a resident of Canada and preferably somebody who lives close by, especially on the health side. You don't have to have the same person in charge of your health as you do for your finances. So oftentimes it makes sense to designate different people. People have different strong suits. Designate the person who's going to be best able to do that. When it comes to a financial power of attorney, that person is going to have the ability to do almost everything that you could do when you were taking care of your finances with the exception of changing beneficiaries. So keep that in mind with the person that you do pick. Now that we've um, gone through some of the baseline things and, and top line things when it comes to estate planning, I really wanted to spend time with what's going on with taxes and understanding death and taxes because it is a big thing that a lot of people don't fully understand how it works. So we're gonna walk through this here with you today. Um, I find the best way for me to learn personally is through examples. So we're gonna go through using a few examples for you here. Um, one thing to note in these examples is we are looking at tax planning and um, estate planning at this point. So I've kind of assumed that these people have a plan in place to ensure their beneficiaries are taken care of. I'm not gonna walk you through an insurance needs analysis. However, that's something that everybody should have done individually because first and foremost, we wanna make sure that your loved ones are taken care of should something ever happen to you. And then of course, second comes planning for taxes and making sure that things are done more efficiently. So what happens when you die? Um, your executor is going to final, file your final tax return and the tax bill could be very, very large. Um, there's different things that are included in tax. So the one that most people realize is your income. But what also happens is you have a deemed disposition of everything you own when you die, meaning any assets you have, a family camp, for example, that might have a capital gain, are all said to be sold the moment before you die. RSPs, RIFs are also deregistered the moment before you die. And that's where we have to look at taxes. So there's two taxes when you pass away, what we like to call the big tax and the little tax. The little tax is probate, which we are going to touch on a little bit later. It is the small tax. It's about one and a half percent. The big tax is income tax. And that's what a lot of people fail to consider when they're planning for estate planning is the big tax. Oftentimes people are going to be in the highest marginal tax bracket when they pass away, which is over 50%. So you want to really make sure that you're taking that into consideration. I also want to point out because there is some misconceptions, I think mostly because we get a lot of American TV, taxes when you pass away are owed by the estate, not the beneficiary. So not the person who inherits the money. It is always the estate that's paying the taxes opportunities to defer and minimize those taxes. Um, there are options to do rollovers and there's a principal residence exemption. You can do charitable giving which will also help reduce your tax bill at time of death. Um, and these are all things that we're going to walk through in an example form just to give you an idea of what you should be considering. So I want to start off before we go through these examples just by saying that we've used a 2021 tax calculator. We have rounded to the nearest dollar. These are meant for examples, um, so they have been simplified a little bit. If you have questions, we're happy to answer them. And if you have specific questions and you want to look at numbers specific to yourself, we can do that separate. These are for illustrative purposes. So the first example I want to start with is keeping things simple. We're going to look at Tom and Tom is um, single at this point. His wife has passed away and therefore 
he does not have the option to look at any rollovers, anything when he passes away. So what we've done here is we've listed Tom's assets. So when Tom passes away, he has a house that is worth $300,000. He spent $200,000. He's lucky he's got a camp. He purchased that for $100,000. It's now worth $200,000. He has an RSP with $150,000 in it, a tax-free savings account with $20,000 in, and non-registered investments. He invested $80,000 and they've grown to $100,000. So when Tom was alive, he had a full pension making $70,000 a year. He was getting $10,000 of CPP, $6,800 in OAS, and making about $10,000 in dividends a year from his non-registered investments. Had Tom lived through all of 2021, his tax bill would have been just shy of $23,000. Instead, we are going to kill Tom off halfway through the year and see what happens to our friend Tom. So again, Tom died halfway through the year, meaning he got half of his $70,000 pension, half of his CPP, OAS, and dividends. So his regular taxable income for half of the year was $48,400. But because we've killed Tom off here, poor Tom had to have all of his assets liquidated the moment before he died. So we had his house. His house is tax-free as he has the principal residence exemption. So there's no income included from that. He has his cottage. So because his cottage is not his principal residence, he does have to include a capital gain in that. So again, the value of the cottage was 200,000. He spent 100,000 on it. So half of that, that's the capital gains inclusion rate, has to be added to his income. He also has his RSP, which is deemed fully withdrawn. So that whole 150,000 gets added to his income. His TFSA, which is not taxable, so doesn't get added to his income. And then of course he has his investments as well. And 50% of the taxable capital gain gets added to his income as well. So his taxable income in his final year ends up being 258,000. So what is the difference on his taxes for dying versus staying alive? Tom's final tax bill is over $100,000 in the year he passes away. So it went from about 23 to 101. The reason for that, again, is he was in one of the top marginal tax brackets. So he was paying over 50% on the last dollar. He also had old age security clawback, which had to be repaid, which is very common as well in year of death. So my point with going through this is really to realize that Tom wasn't a millionaire. It's easy to fall into the highest tax bracket in year of death. And that's the type of thing that we do want to plan ahead for. So we're going to take a minute, pause here to see if we have any questions that have come in. Again, if anybody wants to ask any questions as we're going through anything, there are the two little question marks with bubbles at the top of your screen in the upper right hand corner. It will open a chat on the side of your screen where you're able to answer any question or ask any questions. So I'm going to move on. Please feel free to ask questions throughout. Again, we'll go back and answer anything that we haven't uh, answered live at the moment. So the second example I want to work through today, we're going to get a little more complicated as we go with each one. We're going to talk about Rob and Jen. And Rob and Jen are a married couple. And when they retired, they were enjoying life. When they were working, Jen was a teacher, so she had a defined benefit pension. And Rob was an employee, so his retirement savings role in an RSP. Unfortunately, Rob passed away first, leaving Jen, who is seven years old, but she's a healthy widow. So I want to start by going through what their income looked like pre-death. So Jen had a pension. Again, she had CPP, old age security. So she was bringing in 84,000 a year. Rob had RIF income that they were living off to subsidize CPP and old age security. And while they are both alive, they get to take advantage of something called pension splitting, meaning that Jen is essentially able to give Rob some of her income in a tax perspective to reduce the overall taxes they're paying. So in this case, their household taxes are 21,000 while they're alive and they have cash flow of 101,000. And that's what it looks like while they're alive. They also have their net worth, fairly simple. Their only investments are a riff in Rob's name that came from his working RSPs and they have a house that's in joint name. So what we've done is unfortunately we have had to kill Rob off and we've killed Rob off in February. So we show he had two months of income. And what does that look like? So what we often see is people automatically roll all the assets to the spouse to avoid triggering taxes. So I mentioned earlier, one way to help avoid triggering taxes is that 
RIFs and RSPs are able to be rolled directly to a spouse without any tax triggering. So now all of a sudden that RIF is in Jen's name. She's got the RIF of 400,000 as part of her net worth. The house is well rolled to her, no tax implications there. And that's her net worth. And in the year of death, things actually look pretty good from a tax perspective. You know, they, there's not much taxable income in Rob's name. He only had two months worth of pension income, CPP and OAS, and he paid no taxes. Jen paid a little bit more in taxes as she wasn't able to pension split for the full year. Um, but ultimately not too bad. The household tax bill was 14,000. The cash flow was 76,000. The thing to look at is what happens next. Our job is to help you make decisions and tax plan currently, but also to look forward and look into the future and what happens in future years. So what happens the following year? There's two options. One is that Jen doesn't want to spend the same amount as she was spending and she's okay with less household cash flow. Perhaps a lot of that spending was robbed. Perhaps she's not going to travel without him. Or option two is she does want the cash flow, even though he's not there, she intends to travel. Maybe she's going to visit the grandkids more frequently and she wants to keep up that lifestyle. So if we look at option one, um, what we're seeing is she has her pension, she has her CPP, her old age security. And if you remember, we gave her that RIF. It was all rolled over to her, which means she has to take the RIF minimum. So her total income now is 100,000 but her taxes are 22,000 and she has over 3,000 of old age security clawback. So she's got about 26,000 in essentially taxes that she's paying and her household cash flow is only $74,000. Um, things look a little worse if she decides she does want to continue to have that lifestyle and maintain the cash flow. Because what happens is she has her pension, her CPP or OAS, again, she can't split those anymore. And now, if she wants to maintain the same cash flow, about $101,000 a year, she actually has to take $68,000 out of the RIF, giving her an income of 152, dollars so that she has the ability to pay the tax bill, that $50,000 tax bill, which includes all of her old age security being clawed back. So that, that can be a problem. So the question is, what could they do differently? Um, let's assume in this case that they didn't come and see me before Rob passed away, but they did come and see us after Rob passed away. And we walked through some options here. So first of all, I think it's important to know that the rollover is optional. Sometimes it does make sense to trigger the RIF income at the time of death. So had they chosen to do that in this particular case, Jen's tax bill in the year of death would have been just shy of 19,000. Rob's tax bill in the year of death would have been about 177,000. And I know that is big and that gives a lot of people a shock, but the thing to keep in mind is now that RIF is fully non-registered. There's $222,000 that is available for Jen to spend if she wants to access it without tax implications, if she wants to spend a little bit more throughout her life. If she doesn't want to spend it, she's not forced to take the RIF minimum and have that old age security clawback happening. Also, when Jen ultimately passes away, that money is not in the RIF to be added to her income, which is higher than his income as well. And she would have been back sort of like Tom that we looked at earlier. And lastly, if she chooses to invest, she has tax free savings account room, or she can invest in a non-registered portfolio where the growth is taxed either at zero or 50%. This is not an all or nothing thing. There are lots of options we could have looked at. Perhaps we triggered $200,000 of RIF income in his name and rolled the rest over. Perhaps we used up only up to the top of the 30% tax bracket, looking at the fact that she was never going to be lower than that. The point of this is really to go through and explain that every situation is different. It's not a one answer fits all. It's really that you need to get advice and you need to look at your case. It's important to get it ahead of time, but it's also important to get it after somebody passes away. So before we move into uh, the probate trap, I'm just going to take a second here and look and see if we have any other questions that we need to answer um, that have come through. Again, if you want to ask questions, feel free, answer them. Uh, we'll answer them as we go or again at the end. And you can do that through the chat feature. So while we're going through some of the questions coming in, um, we're going to keep moving on here, keep in the interest of time. So the next thing I want to talk about is probate. Every time I see the probate trap, I feel like we should go da da da. Probate is one of the most misunderstood things ever. So we're going to walk through it with an example here. And my example is going to be Mary Mum. Mary is a single 80 year old woman. She has no house and has never owned one. 
She has a family cottage worth 150,000 that she intends to claim as her principal residence. She has a RIF worth 300,000 and a non-registered GIC worth 150,000. Mary has two children that she loves equally and she wants to split her estate equally. She has a son who lives in Sudbury who brings the kids to camp every weekend and a daughter who lives in BC who doesn't plan to come back to Sudbury and doesn't really have any interest in that camp. For simplicity reasons, we're gonna assume that Mary died January 1st. So the probate trap. Somebody told Mary that there was probate when you die and the government was gonna take a huge chunk for estate. Mary panicked. She didn't go talk to a lawyer. She didn't come talk to me or Linda. And she decided she was gonna avoid this by naming beneficiaries. So she named her daughter as the beneficiary of her RSP. She heard that when you name somebody as a beneficiary of an RSP or a registered account, it passes outside of the estate and therefore doesn't attract probate. She also heard that having her son as joint owner on the camp would make it so that there was no probate on that. Her goal was the daughter was gonna get the RRSP worth 300,000 and the son was gonna get the camp and the extra cash and they would be equal. So before we say what happened, let's walk through what probate actually is. So probate or the administration tax, first of all, is the tiny tax. In Ontario, it's one and a half percent. It is not a huge number and it's essentially the fee that they charge to make sure that the will is uh, recognized as the final and last will so that financial institutions can act upon it. There are anything that goes through the estate is included in probate and it's based on the fair market value of those assets. So things that do not go through the estate would be things that are not included in probate. Um, I'm not going to get too much into talking about joint ownership because I know Linda will touch on that. I will just say be very, very, very careful when you put joint ownership in place as a way to avoid probate. You will avoid one and a half percent and potentially cost yourself substantially more. And it may also make it so you don't accomplish what you're hoping to accomplish. So if we go back to Mary, what actually happened when she tried to plan for probate? So her daughter got the $300,000 from the RSP outside of the estate. The son got the $150,000 cottage outside the estate. The GIC passed through the estate. There was nothing she could do about that. What she didn't think about was the tax bill from the RSP. That tax bill goes to the estate of $122,000. So the daughter got the 300,000 and when you were um, wrapping up an estate, the RSPs or RIFs are paid out without withholding tax. So that money goes directly to the beneficiary and the bill goes to the estate. So luckily in this case, there was a GIC available to pay that tax bill. But after that tax bill was paid, there was only 27,000 left. So the daughter got 300,000, the son got 177, not what mom wanted. And again, this was best case scenario and a worst case plan. Had the estate not had the cash to pay that tax bill, there could have been a problem. Again, on adding the son as joint on the camp, had the son been married and gotten divorced before mom died, that could have been a big problem. There are lots of other problems that could arise from this. So you wanna make sure you're, you're looking at that. So in this particular case, planning ahead can help. And again, planning ahead on the whole picture. Don't probate plan to the detriment of everything else. It is a small number. So in this particular case, let's assume that Mary met me when she was 60 years old and we started working together and we put a plan in place to ensure that the son got the camp and that both kids got equal value from the estate. I spoke to Mary about an alternative investment option called Whole Life. I told her there was a way that we can invest some of the money that was currently sitting in that GIC in the non-registered account into a Whole Life plan it would continue to grow inside that whole life plan over the course of her life, tax-free. And when she passed away, there would be a tax-free death benefit paid out to the beneficiaries. She could use this plan to increase the value of her state and also to make it more efficient. So let's look at what that actually looks like. So let's look at Mary Mum, who's a Kilgarger client. She's now still 80 years old, single woman, no house, never owned one. Family cottage worth 150,000 that she's gonna claim as her principal residence. Her RIF is still worth 300,000. 
Her non-registered GIC in this case is only worth 68,500 because every year we moved $4,000 over to the whole life policy and invested in there. Her whole life policy's death benefit at the time that she's 80 years old when we we're going to kill Port Mary off is worth 163,000. So what does that look like in practice? In this particular case, for simplicity, we show everything going through the well. So the RSP, um, the cottage, the GAC all pass through the well, including the insurance in this particular case from a simplicity standpoint. The RSP still has a tax bill of 122, and we've now created a probate bill of 9,480. Again, in the grand scheme of things, not the biggest number to be looking at. But what has happened by doing this? Now, the net value of our state is actually uh, close to 550,000, and each kid is going to get 275,000. The son can then use that to purchase the camp essentially from the estate, and they will be equal getting what they want and making it simpler. I'm not gonna get into the purchasing the camp from the estate, because again, Linda will cover that. She's the expert on that, but it's a much cleaner way of setting things up moving forward. So don't let probate terrify you into making a poor decision. So when we talk about insurance as an investment vehicle, lots of people say no. Many, many people say, I wanna spend it all. So insurance is great, but I don't plan on leaving anything to my kids. They will get what they get at the end, if there's anything left. So I wanna show you an option where I say, what if you could have that money, you could have access to it, control it through your whole life, and only if you don't spend it, then it's tax efficient and go to the kids. So let's go back to Mary, who met Lindsay. Let's say she didn't die at 80. Instead, at 80 years old, she had a huge party, spent all of her money, and now she's 90 years old and she needs more money because she thought she was gonna die at 80. Well, that whole life policy that we illustrated a few slides ago actually has a cash surrender value that she can access of $173,000 when she's 90 years old. So she has access to that money until she passes away. In this slide, we're just showing the example. This is the exact example we used. Again, it's for illustrative purposes. If this is something you're interested in, we can definitely look through them and what the numbers would look like for you. But as you can see here, there is a cash surrender value. So if you outlive your money, if you outlive your plan, you have access to this. If not, the death benefit passes through tax-free. So we have one more example left. We're just gonna walk through here. And then we're gonna pass things on to Linda to answer all of your questions. So our last example here are Joe and Jane. They were business owners and they incorporated early on and have done most of their savings in the company. Unfortunately, Jane passed away early at the age of 65 and Joe passed away not long after. When Joe passed away, he thought he had a net worth of about 2.58 million. He had TFSAs that they had saved, a little bit in RSPs they had saved throughout 20,000 and a house worth 500,000. And the bulk of their wealth was in the corporation, which they figured was worth 2 million in investments. They had, and that was because their investments were 2 million. And they had actually only invested 1,050,000 and they had grown to that 2 million. What is their actual value of their estate once these state bills are paid? So again, this is for illustrative purposes. We don't wanna to get too deep into the numbers here, but it's important to realize when you're talking about corporations, there are two sets of taxes to be paid. There are taxes to be paid by the corporation. So there are cap based on the capital gains in that corporation. And then there are taxes to be paid to get that money out of the corporation. Because again, the deemed disposition also applies to private corporations and holding companies. So in this particular case, the corporation will have taxes owing of about 92,000. That's gonna leave money to pay out as a dividend, which has to go to the estate. That dividend is income to the estate, which means there's going to be taxes owed by the estate of, in this particular case, 683,000. That's a fairly substantial amount. So when you look at what's available after all the taxes paid, you got about 1.2 million from the corporation. He of course has his house, his tax-free savings account are both tax-free, and then there were taxes owed on the RSP, so there's only about 9,000 left. So he lost a million dollars to the tax man in terms of what they thought this value was worth from an estate. 
again, this is an example. Anytime you're dealing with this, you do need to consult an accountant, but we just want to walk through so you realize that what you think you have isn't always the after tax version. So, as you've noticed, planning a kid can help. So, let's assume that Joe and Jane met me when they were younger and when business was going well and they had some extra money to invest. They didn't know how well they were going to do over the next 20 years, but they knew they wanted to retire at 60 with no bill payments and they wanted to spend all their money if they were able to and the kids would essentially get what was left. I walked through and talked a little bit about an alternative investment that could work for them. Whole life as an investment when you're talking about corporations makes a lot of sense because there's actually two ways you can save taxes. First, you don't pay tax on the growth inside the company. So that first company line we looked at, you do not pay tax on the growth, which is very important to know because passive income is taxed at approximately 50% in a company, as well as that dividend that's paid out at the end, that $683,000 tax triggering event is also tax free. So let's walk through how that works. I sat down and we created a plan. We decided they had some excess money to invest and a portion of what they were investing, we would take 10,000 and put into a whole life plan. The intention was that they were gonna live off their RSPs and corporate investments from the time Joe turned 60 to 70. At 70 years old, they were gonna need access to more money. So they were gonna take access to some of the funds that they had built up in that whole life plan. They planned on continuing to spend money out of that plan until they were 80. And at 80, they figured they'd slow down. They wouldn't be traveling as much, so they would be able to go back to living off, not needing access to the whole life investments, but other investments, and they would live till age 90. So again, we walked through planning. Planning ahead makes a big difference. With that whole life plan, the intention being that if you die, you get the tax benefit, but there's also tax benefits if you live and you wanna access it. So again, you don't pay tax on the growth, while it's invested in that policy. When you want to take money out while you're alive, you do have to pay tax when you dividend to shareholders. But I mean, that's okay. We always have to pay some tax. We get a lot of benefits for living in Canada and we want to make sure we pay some of that, but we want to make sure we're being efficient. So the plan was this. The intention was that they were going to invest $10,000 into that policy for 20 years. So $200,000. They were then going to access that money, pay taxes on it, getting it out as a dividend, and have cash in their pocket for the 10 years of $113,000. And I showed them a comparison, a investment option that would allow them to do this or the whole life policy. And the investment option, after they invested their money, pulled it out, paid the tax man, had some fun. At the end of the day, they had $128,000 left which after taxes was only worth about 74 to the estate. On the life insurance side, they still put the same 200,000 in. They still had the same amount of fund, paid the tax man on the way out to get their 113. But at the time they passed away, there was 577,000 left and all of that could come out tax-free. So this was a plan that was supposed to allow these, um, this couple to enjoy their money, access it, and have a good investment and plan through retirement. What actually happened is they died prematurely. So while the plan was to have them access the money and have fun, and we were planning for the best case scenario, the plan was also here for the worst case scenario. And when they died early, we go through the same calculation. There is less money in the assets, so less capital gains to be paid by the corporation because some of that is protected and hidden inside the whole life policy. When you take out that dividend, again, a larger portion comes out tax-free, so the taxes owed by the estate for the dividend are significantly lower, and we've increased the value of the state. So at the end of the day, with this particular strategy with this couple, we reduced the taxes they paid by about 13% and increased the value of the state by over 20%. So again, this is not to say that this works for everybody. It's to say planning ahead helps and we need to plan ahead for best and worst case scenarios and what's going to happen both ways. So if I haven't said enough, planning ahead is important, but it's not something that you can just plan, set and forget. You need to review things every three, every few years, every three to five years, looking over things. Also, when you have major life changes, um, there are a lot of things that can update what you want to happen. 
if you have a new common law relationship, that doesn't automatically impact a will. So you may need to update your documents, look at your beneficiaries. Marriage is actually something that revokes previous wills. So if you get married, your old will may not be valid. That's a really important thing to know. You will need to update your will. Oddly enough, while marriage revokes wills, divorce does not. Again, if you get divorced, you may not want your ex-spouse to be the beneficiary and have full control over your estate. So these are things that you really do want to go through and, and look at. So I'm going to take a moment here to see if we have any questions. I've had the opportunity to share a little bit with you about the basics of estate planning and more about the details of taxes and how that is affected at time of death. So I'm going to take a minute before I introduce Linda to just see if there are any particular questions with regards to anything I've said so far and anything regarding taxes. We're just checking to see if any questions come in. We'll go through the legal disclaimers, of course, here. When you're sitting next to a lawyer, you have to make sure you get those out of the way. <laughs> All right, so I'm going to go through now and introduce Linda. Again, if you have questions, feel free to continue typing them in. We will answer them as they come up, and we will answer again after the seminar is over. So I want to thank Linda uh, for being here with us tonight. She is a wealth of knowledge when it comes to all things estate. Her expertise is in estates, trust and wills, guardianship applications, and power of attorney. She is a founding partner at MLA, and prior to being at MLA, she was um, a partner at a previous law firm. Linda's practiced in Sudbury since 2007, and prior to that, she was in Toronto. So we're very, very lucky to have her here, and we want to take full advantage of that. So I'm not going to take any more time talking. We're going to hand things over to Linda here and allow her to start sharing her expertise with you. Hello everyone and thank you very much uh, Lindsay for that uh, very nice introduction. I have to say I'm, I'm so impressed with your wealth of knowledge when it comes to, to estate planning and uh, I don't know how much more I can add to this. Um, there are um, some questions um, that um, um, have been posed here and um, I'm just going to read it out to you and then I'm going to try to answer those as they come in. Um, so the first question is, um, is there anything to substantiate the rumor that the primary residence exemption may be taken away in light of our current coming financial predicament as a country due to COVID? And, and um, I'm going to pass that one over to uh, Lindsay later on. Um, so uh, the next question is, why should executor and powers of attorneys be residents of Canada or live in close proximity? And that's a very good question. I, I think the there is a number of different answers to that. Um, let's start with the uh, estate trustee. So uh, when uh, you are appointed uh, as the executor or executrix of an estate, um, the estate becomes a trust. And uh, under um, it, trust law, um, the jurisdiction of the trust is where the estate trustee resides. So in the event that you, let's say, live in the U.S. and um, you are appointed as the estate trustee of a Canadian estate, then the Canadian estate will be subject to both U.S. as well as Canadian income taxes. And what the result of that is going to be, it depends on the value of the estate and a whole host of other factors, but it certainly creates a lot of complications uh, in that um, there could be adverse income tax consequences and the estate trustee would have to do income taxes in both jurisdictions. So there would certainly be more accounting uh, fees involved with that and uh, it just becomes a lot more cumbersome that way. Um, in addition, there is a 
pragmatic component. It's just uh, if your estate trustee lives outside of the country and you have, say, real estate and other assets that requires immediate attention, there would be a lot of uh, back and forth um, and a lot of expenses associated with taking care of, of your estate uh, by way of travel costs and accommodations and so on and so forth. So from that perspective as well, it makes sense to appoint somebody who's more local. For the power of attorney question why it's better to appoint somebody who is a Canadian resident, a number of financial institutions do not take uh, trading instructions from a non-resident. And so you could end up in a situation where um, your, your attorney for property wants to cash in your investments. They can't do that because the banking institution will not take their instructions because they live in, in a different jurisdiction. Uh, the same and the same issue, of course, with respect to pragmatics. It's just easier in the event that you live closer by, in the event that there are assets that need to be safeguarded and that you need to sort of monitor on a fairly regular basis. Um, I'm going to move on to uh, another question, which is, um, my stepfather owns uh, a large property. I'm assuming that's real property and has tax-free savings and margin accounts and other assets. Uh, how can we reduce his tax burden, burden after he passes and what can we do before he passes? And I think really think this is a Lindsay question. I'm going to leave that to her to answer later on. And um, the next question is one that's, uh, that's very familiar to me. A lot of my clients ask me this and it is, should I have a joint account with my family member? And this is something that a lot of my clients ask me. Uh, and uh, my, my answer to that is if it's your spouse and you intend to leave that money to your spouse in any event, then it makes perfect sense that you arrange for his or her name to be added to your account as a joint account holder. My assumption is that when you refer to a family member, you're referring to somebody other than your spouse. And if that is the question, that is, should you arrange for any of your, say, your children's names to be added to your accounts? And my answer to that is always no. I think it's a terrible idea. And um, there's a whole host of reasons for that. Um, let's say that you, let's say you add your son's name to your accounts. And um, let's say that uh, your son um, gets into trouble. He has a whole host of creditors coming after him and they pursue him in court. There's litigation, they win. There's a big judgment um, against him. There is, there, those judgment creditors are gonna go out there and look for anything that has your son's name on it. And they're not gonna care that, that he's just on your account so that you, for convenience sake, so that he can administer those assets for you if you become incapable of managing them or in order to save a little bit of money on probate fees. Again, like, like Lindsay said, the little tax, 1.5%. They're gonna go after those assets. Uh, again, if, if, you're, if your son uh, declares bankruptcy, and then the trustee in bankruptcy is gonna do exactly the same thing. So go out there and look for anything that has your son's name on it and not gonna care that you just put his name on there so that you wouldn't have to pay 1.5% probate fees when you pass away. Or if your son should separate and or divorce, uh, his, uh, his spouse might have something to say about those assets as well. There's also another issue and that has to do with misappropriation. So what if uh, your son has financial difficulties and his name is on your account and it's so easy for him to just go in there and take the money out of that account, which he could do if his name was jointly on that account with you. Um, so you could end up just to save 1.5% on your assets, you could end up with nothing. So for all of those reasons, I think it's a really bad idea. From my perspective as an estate practitioner and from the my experiences uh, with what happens, what can happen in that situation in the event that uh, you pass away, Let's say that you have um, more than one child and you just put one of your children's names on those on your accounts and then you pass away. Your child could take the position that those assets belong to him by right of survivorship and that he's not uh, required to share them with his siblings, which may not be what you want to have happen to those assets. Your idea might be to, I, I want to save a little bit of money on probate fees, but I still want my son to share with my other children. 
that could that might not happen or it could potentially happen but there might be litigation as a result of that and you could end up or, or there might not be much left in the estate after the lawyers are done taking out their fees with respect to trying to litigate that matter so from from all of for all of those different reasons i always recommend to my clients do not do that keep things clean unless it's with your spouse keep things in your own name keep it simple don't add anybody else's names onto those assets all right um so i'm gonna move on to the next question um it says oh it looks like a tough one it says i've been bequeathed a portion of a rural land along with my three siblings when my father passed in 1995. The land to date remains in the name of the estate of my father. Since his passing, two of my siblings have also passed, leaving myself and one brother. One of my brothers that passed has two minor children, no spouse. Oh, here we go. Um, would the property automatically pass to the remaining people left in the original will? Or do we have to consider succession laws for my brother's minor children? That's a great question. So uh, I can't answer that um, without. Um, well, I think I can answer that. Let me just look at it again. So there was three siblings. So uh, your dad left a will then by, by way of which he left uh, that property to the three of you, but it was just never transferred into your name. And um, so you're saying that after he passed away, two of your siblings have also passed, leaving just you and your brothers. There was four of you all together. So that means that right now, uh, even though the property was never transferred to you, you have a, a vested one quarter interest in that property, as does your brother who also is still living. With respect to your brothers who passed away after your, um, after your father passed away, or your, your father passed away, and one of them has two minor children, but no spouse. So uh, that means then that because that property is vested in your brother, that, that one quarter is vested in him because he survived your father, that one quarter will then go to whomever he left it to by way of his will. So if in his will, he indicated that, um, whatever he had or that or that property in particular were to go to his two children, then um, that would be what would happen. That property will then go to his two children. If they're under the age of 18, then uh, my suggestion would be not to transfer it over to them until they turn 18, unless you want to get the office of the public of the children's lawyer involved. And then with respect to uh, the other brother, um, again, it would be the same uh, idea, whatever uh, your brother said in his will, because he survived your father, uh, just because the property wasn't transferred to him doesn't mean that it's not his, it forms part of his estate. And then who, whomever he left it to by way of his will will then get that property. If he left no will, then it would flow pursuant to the laws of intestacy in Ontario, which means that if he had a spouse, um, and, and children, it would be divided uh, amongst them depending on the size of his estate in a particular format. Great question. Okay, so I see that there is another question here. Um, it says, okay, I can't even get down to this one here. Lindsay, can you help me out with this one? But I can do an iPad to read off of. Okay. So. Technology. Yes. Under what circumstances does it make sense to consider setting up a trust fund for children or heirs? So that's a, a, another a great question um, and, and not one that I can answer in a very um, short period of time. Uh, unfortunately, it's going to be a little bit convoluted and boring and I so apologize. And, um, so trusts are set up for a whole host of reasons. Uh, Lindsay already talked about a, a Henson trust. So that would be a particular type of trust that you would set up for a uh, beneficiary um, who is in receipt of uh, Ontario Disability Support Plan benefits. Uh, because uh, if uh, 
one of your beneficiaries, maybe a child, is in receipt of those benefits and they are provided with a direct inheritance, and then they might very well be disqualified from their receipt of, of those benefits. So you want to make sure that you leave it at that your inheritance to a disabled child in such a fashion that he or she can enjoy the inheritance without being disqualified from his or her receipt of disability benefits. And so a Henson Trust will accomplish that. It's also called an absolute discretionary trust and it's the kind of uh, it's it, it's absolutely discretionary because the trustee of that trust, the person who's going to be administering the trust for the benefit of the disabled child, has complete discretion with respect to how much and how little to pay out. So in other words, your child will not be in a position to go to the trustee and say, I want my money now. And that means then that uh, the government has then accepted that the child has no ability to control the funds and therefore um, has accepted that it doesn't form part of his or her assets for the purposes of figuring out whether or not he or she qualifies for disability uh, benefits. So that's one type of trust. Another um, trust that you might want, another reason why you might want to consider setting up a trust for somebody is if you have uh, young children. So children who are um, uh, under the age of 18 or who may be older than that, and but you uh, are concerned about providing them with too much money too soon uh, because you want to make sure that um, they're not going to spend it all uh, all at once and um, you want to make sure as well that um, they're not going to be taken advantage of by uh, by other people uh, so you want to just sort of space it out to them over some years um, and you also may want to set up a trust for an older um, child in the event that you are concerned about his or her ability to manage money. And so you, you have a child that just has no idea how to manage money. They're continually getting into trouble with, with creditors and they spend every dime they have. If they have $10, they spend 11. And you may, they, they are in a job that doesn't provide them with a pension. You may want to set up a trust so that the money is going to flow out to them in such a fashion that you're providing a sort of a substitute pension for them in their years of retirement. I've seen that happening as well, and that that's certainly not a bad idea. Um, so um, those are some reasons why you might want to set up trusts. Um, you uh, may also want to consider setting up a trust if you are, say, in a, a situation where you um, are in a second relationship. Um, you um, have uh, children by a, a prior relationship. You're now in a new relationship. You want to leave some money to your current spouse, but you're concerned that in the event that he dies a couple of years after you do, then all that money that you're leaving to him will just go to his children and will not end up with your children. So you could set up a trust whereby uh, your spouse will be entitled to uh, all of the income from uh, the gift that you leave to him and maybe a certain portion of the of the principal, so maybe five or 10 percent per annum. And then in the event that he dies, uh, before all the money has been spent, then that money will go to your children as opposed to going to his children. So that's one reason why you might want to do that. There are also some other types of trusts that you can set up, and those um, um, are uh, maybe something that Lindsay could talk about as well. They have to do more with um, tax uh, uh, planning, both the, the mostly the little tax planning, and also with respect to um, trying to safeguard your assets in your lifetime. Um, so those are, uh, are trusts called uh, alter ego and joint partner trusts, and they're trusts that people who are over the age of 65 can enter into if they're Canadian taxpayers. And uh, the government allows people who uh, qualify to transfer uh, assets into into that type of trust, either alone or with their spouses uh, on a tax deferred basis. So the money can just go roll in there without triggering a deemed disposition of those assets. And then they sit in that trust and they can only be used for the benefit of the of the spouses or the spouse if it's just one person or the individual if it's just one person in his or her lifetime. And so all that money has to be used uh, for uh, his or her benefit or their benefit. And uh, in event that the um, that the people that the settlers or the people who have transferred that money into the trust uh, become incapable of managing their finances, then there's a system put in place by way of that document whereby the 
uh, trustees, the other trustees of the trust or the, or the substitutional trustees in that trust will just be in a position to, to just seamlessly take over and start managing those, those assets. This is, um, these are, um, and then when that person passes away, then there's no probate fees payable on those assets. And these are trusts that are particularly attracted to people who have higher wealth. Uh, they want to make sure that there's no probate fees payable on it. Again, that's the little fee, 1.5%, so nothing to lose any kind of sleepover. But they're also concerned about um, elder financial abuse. And that is one of the, uh, the, the most significant types of, of, of abuse there is uh, amongst uh, amongst elders is financial abuse. And so by way of transferring those assets into the trust, they're locked in. And then it's not something that is going to be that um, third parties can then access by way of putting their names jointly on, on your bank accounts and so on and so forth. They, those assets have been transferred to that trust and will then be administered during your incapacity should that happen by the people you trust the most when you set up that trust document. So those are some uh, different types of trust that you can uh, set up and some of the reasons why you might want to do that. Um, there's another question here. Um, uh, the question is, um, what is the best way to set up a trust with a beneficiary who cannot manage their own affairs due to deficiencies? And or those who haven't attained a certain, I think I sort of touched on that. Um, so a deficiency is by that if you mean somebody who is incapable of managing his or her property, again, probably a Henson Trust you'd want to look at in that particular situation. Um, the next question is, how long does an executor have to hang on to uh, everything and paperwork once an estate is settled? Um, I, it, I once you have received what's called your clearance certificate from Revenue Canada, which is um, a document that Revenue Canada provides to you if you've applied for, for it, whereby uh, Revenue Canada uh, guarantees that even if that they've gone behind the last tax return, they've looked back to previous years and they have found no tax liability owed by the estate. And even if they find one subsequently, they're not going to go after you in your in your personal capacity as the, as the in your capacity as the estate trustee for having distributed the assets without without um, paying the tax liability. Then I think you're you're pretty it's pretty safe for you to uh, to distribute the funds uh, to the beneficiaries. And in the event that everybody is uh, fine with the way that you've managed the estate, you provided everybody with a, an informal accounting of everything that came in and everything that went out, and they've agreed they've signed releases to you and there's no possibility or that they've they've released any claim that they may have in the estate they're not going to bring at litigation against you then um you uh, are okay to wind down the estate but i still recommend that you just hang on to everything for a period of i would say maybe three or four years at least afterwards just in case there is something that pops up with respect to any kind of unexpected uh, unexpected liability Next question is, how is the um, executor fee uh, calculated? Um, this is a, a, a great question and uh, there is no um, law uh, or regulation in Ontario that says exactly how much you can take in compensation for acting as an estate trustee. But the rule of thumb is usually uh, roughly 5% of the value of the estate. But that can be adjusted up and down depending on the complexity of the estate, how long it takes to administer, the amount of skill and expertise you lend to the task, um, the amount of years it's taken you to administer it, um, the results obtained. Uh, so um, sometimes uh, I've seen it in the state trustee take up to 10% and sometimes it's less than that and, and sometimes they don't take any compensation. Uh, but uh, if the thing with respect to uh, compensation is this, um, you, uh, I always recommend to my clients that because there is no set law in Ontario with respect to how much you can take, in the event that there's nothing in the will that says how much your estate trustee can take in compensation, then before the executor takes compensation, he or she has to either get the consent of all the beneficiaries to the uh, amount of compensation that he or she wants to take. Uh, and if the uh, beneficiaries don't agree to that, then he or she would have to go to court in order to get a judge to look at his or her accounts and, and the compensation that he or she wants and then uh, put his proper stamp on it. 
So the, if you don't want to spend, uh, if you don't want your estate uh, to spend a lot of money on uh, getting your accounts passed and going before a court to, to get uh, the compensation fixed, the better way to do this would be by way of you fixing the compensation in your will. So in your will, you would say, this is what my estate trustee can take in terms of compensation. And it could be a monetary amount or it could be a percentage of the value of your estate. I typically recommend a percentage because none of us have a crystal ball. We don't know how much money is going to be left in your estate when you pass away. And so if you leave $10,000 to your estate trustee in compensation and there's only $20,000 in your estate, then your estate trustee is going to end up with 50% of the value your estate and that's probably not what you would have wanted so better idea to go with a percentage when it comes to that but do fix it in your will because that way they can take it and there's nobody who can complain about that all right so i see that there is a question about a family camp one of my favorite questions so uh, we are part owners of a family camp there's my husband two aunts one uncle and my husband's mom who are on this deed his mom has it that when she passes away, her share will go to my husband. When, what we're worried about is that when the aunts and uncles who have multiple children pass their share to their children, it would look like they have an equal share. Where is, where do we have? Mm -hmm. um, so I think the question is, how do we make sure that it shows that my husband will have a bigger share than his cousins? Uh, that's a, a great question and um, that's all a matter of conveyancing. So it's all going to show up in, in the land titles um, documents. So the land title system is, the, is the, um, the, the electronic system in Ontario whereby we register real property. And in that system, um, then if there's multiple owners like this, it, as who own a piece of property as tenants in common, that is, they own a certain percentage of the value of that, prop, of, of that property, that it will list exactly how much each, ten, each tenant in common owns in terms of a percentage. And so that's going to go right on there. So um, it, it, that, that document will then show that you own more than, um, than your husband's cousins. And one of the things that you and your husband could do, and I recommend that you do that, is uh, your husband's portion of that. So let's say your husband, I, I, I'm, trying, I'm trying to do the math in my head, but I'm notoriously difficult to add that I have a very difficult time with math. So I'm not really going to be able to figure out right, right on the basis of this, how much of a percentage your, your husband owns, but let's just say he owns an eighth of that property. So you could take your, your husband's one eighth of that property and you could put that into joint ownership as between the two of you. So that if your husband um, passes away before you do, then his one eighth will just go straight to you as the, uh, as the surviving joint tenant. Okay, so then there's a question here that says, what life events revoke a will? That's another good question. Uh, Lindsay did uh, touch on that and she was indicating, and this is, a com uh, I completely agree with that, that um, in the event that uh, you um, marry, then uh, typically the will would be revoked as a result of that, something that few people give any kind of thought to. Uh, there is uh, some chatter going around with respect to um, legislators wanting to change that because it seems so counterintuitive uh, to a lot of people. Uh, so uh, that may be changed in the future, but as it is right now, once you marry, you revoke the will. Um, and um, it's, separation does not um, revoke the will. Divorce is a funny kind of thing. So in the event that you, let's say you have a will wherein uh, you leave everything you have to your spouse, um, uh, and in the event that and, and you appoint your spouse to be your executor, that's how most people do it, and then you subsequently divorce, then uh, under the law, uh, your uh, that appointment where you appointed your spouse to be your estate trustee is deemed to be invalid, and any gift that you left to your spouse is deemed to be void, and your will is going to be read as though your, your spouse predeceased you. So that's at least good, but separation does nothing. So in the event that you've been separated for 25 years and and you die and let's say you have no will, then under your law, your spouse is going to be entitled to the lion's share of your estate. So really important that in the event of something like that, what you have in one of the thir first things you want to do is go out there and change your will. Because if you don't, then the money is going to end up in the hands of somebody that you don't want the money in your mouth. All right. Um, the next question is, 
No, I think I've answered those. What if the executor declines? Um, and that's another good question. So, uh, th and that's the reason why I always recommend to my clients that before they appoint anybody, that they um, um, that they uh, ask um, the person that they wish to appoint whether or not uh, they feel comfortable with that appointment. Because if they don't, there is nothing that forces them to act. So they could just uh, sign a one-page document called a renunciation, and then it would be up to the persons that have been appointed. Um, uh, as alternates under that document to take over. And if there are no alternates that, alter, alternates that are prepared to take over at that point in time, then there is a pecking order under something and law called the Estates Act with respect to who has the first kick at the can but, uh, with respect to becoming appointed as the estate trustee. And it's the spouse. And um, it, it's a funny sort of thing uh, under estates law, but uh, the spouse is defined as either a married spouse or somebody that you're living with in a common law relationship. Um, but under the Succession Law Reform Act, um, as a common law spouse has no entitlement to share in their estates, only a married spouse. So a common law spouse could be in a situation where his or her spouse passes away. He or she gets nothing under his or her estate, but has a first right to administer the estate, which is kind of weird. But in any event, it would be first your spouse who has a first a right to become appointed as the estate trustee, and then it would be your nearest next of kin, which is typically your children if you have any. If no children, then grandchildren. If no grandchildren, then it would be your parents. If you don't have any parents, it would be your siblings. If you don't have any siblings, it would be your um, nieces and nephews. If no nieces and nephews, then it would be your aunts and uncles, then your cousins, and so on and so forth, and until it sort of trickles down to the nearest to descendant, whoever that is, would have a first entitlement to become appointed. So if none of those are really suitable candidates, then much better to get a will done and, and appoint somebody that you feel would be a more suitable candidate for them. Okay, that's it. I think there's two more there. Do you need a, I don't see it. I can read them if you'd like. Or can you tell me where they are? Do you, do you need yes. a, do you need a certificate of clearance before you get an inheritance? Um, uh, so um, that depends on the circumstances. I would certainly recommend it if uh, um, it sort of puts a period to things as well. So that's it. You can wind up the estate at that point in time. So for that perspective, I think it's a good idea. Sometimes it doesn't really make sense. So let's say that um, mom passes away. She appoints you to be the executrix of her estate or executive of her estate, and she leaves everything that she has to you. So you're the only beneficiary under her estate. Under those circumstances, I don't know if it makes a whole lot of sense for you to, to go out and get a clearance certificate. There could be some exceptions to that. Um, but um, in the event that it turns out that you have distributed the estate, and there's still a tax liability owing, and the Revenue Canada would have the ability to go after the beneficiaries uh, for that tax liability as well. So whether you're the estate trustee or the or the sole beneficiary, they're going to come after you and get that money in any event. So I don't know if you definitely if you need a clearance certificate under those under those circumstances. What happens if the estate has more debts than assets? Who's liable to pay the difference? And this is a good question and one that I, I come across a couple of times. It's never a good situation. Um, so in the event that the estate is insolvent, which is what happens when there are more liabilities than assets in the estate, um, there's a couple of different options. Uh, one would be that the estate trustee starts to negotiate with all of the, uh, with all of the creditors, maybe get into some kind of an agreement with them whereby um, the they all agree that they're going to take a certain reduced uh, portion of the estate. First, the typically first secured creditors are paid out. So that is, for example, if there's real estate in the estate and there's a mortgage um, that's registered on title, then that would be paid out in full to the extent that that's possible um, on the basis of the liquidity of the estate. And then all of the unsecured creditors, um, with a few exceptions, would then be paid rateably. 
it's a nasty, nasty situation. You don't want to become appointed as the estate trustee of, of an insolvent estate. It's this creditors calling you left, right, and center, and you have to sort of start trying to negotiate a solution with them. Not, no fun at all. Uh, really, in that situation, I typically recommend to my clients that they try to uh, get a, a trustee in bankruptcy involved who could take over, administer the estate on the basis of, of of a bankruptcy and then um, and then y y you wouldn't have to deal with it because it really is no fun to be a at the center of all that kind of attention. And, you, and the question is who's liable to pay the difference? Well, if there's not enough money in the estate, then um, it's just not going to get paid. And there is, unless somebody has guaranteed those debts, it's just not going to get paid. Everybody just has to take a reduced amount of the unsecured creditors. Uh, some um, some of the unsecured creditors rank higher than others. So, for example, Revenue Canada uh, certainly is taking the position that it ranks above other unsecured creditors. Um, expenses that are necessary in order to take care of the administration of the estate. So, for example, funeral expenses, accounting and legal fees, typically they would rank um, uh, over other unsecured creditors, but everybody else would be paid greater. And then uh, there is a question here that says, what if no one wants to be executor? That is no assets. Well, if there are no assets, uh, I'm wondering if it's strictly necessary for anybody to administer the estate. Um, if there's nothing there to be uh, distributed, uh, it may not be necessary for anybody to do that. Um, so um, if there is a will, for example, the person who's been appointed under the will would be in a position to take care of the funeral arrangements and do everything else that's necessary. And, and but probate really wouldn't be uh, be necessary, and uh, there wouldn't really be a real need to administer the estate under those circumstances. And I think that's it. Is there any more? Oh, one more that just came in. One more. Okay. Save the best for last. Okay. Can I instruct a third party uh, executor to distribute my state 50 50 after taxes to my current wife, not the mother of my children, and my three children? Um, so uh, the, the question, it, the answer is absolutely. And the way that you would do that is by way of, of leaving a will. I think maybe uh, what you're getting at here is um, would this. Um, give rise to some kind of litigation in the event that let's say that you um, leave only 50% of to your uh, of 50 percent of your estate to your spouse and she's not happy with that result, could that result in litigation against your estate? And the answer to that is yes, absolutely. So um, when uh, somebody dies and uh, they don't leave um, everything that they have uh, to their spouse, there are certain um, remedies that are available to that spouse. And one of them would be um, that they could um, bring a claim for support against your estate. So then they uh, could go to court and they could say, well, um, uh, um, Bob always took care of me in my lifetime and now he's passed away and all of a sudden uh, everything, uh, my, all of my income has been reduced by 50%. I just don't have enough to take care of me, to support me. Uh, it, in, in the same manner that I that I was able to do while Bob was still living, and um, I um, I'm asking for an order whereby I'm provided with 75% of the estate or 100% of the estate, and uh, then uh, it will be uh, up to a judge to determine whether or not um, an order should flow uh, pursuant to that uh, kind of litigation. Um, it's important to know that uh, in order for that kind of claim to be successful. There's sort of two prongs to the test. The first is that you have to be a dependent spouse. So uh, your um, your Bob has to have either provided you with financial support uh, while you were uh, living together in a relationship, or um, he has to have been under an obligation to provide you with financial support. So in the event that that, that the two of you, uh, that you and Bob were uh, living uh, together and and you kept separate uh, bank accounts. Each of you paid your own expenses and uh, there was no sort of give and take with respect to that. Then it would be very difficult to uh, to satisfy that prong of the test. 
And then at the second prong is that in the event that you were a dependent spouse, then um, there's a whole rack of factors that the court would look at to determine whether or not you, you are entitled to, to um, spousal support and what the quantum of that spousal support would be. So um, the, in, in short, the answer is yes, you can um, do what you're planning on doing, but uh, will there be some legal consequences that flow from that? And the answer to that is yes. And um, and in particular, when it comes to litigation, uh, you can't uh, really um, maneuver your way out of that. I mean, anybody can sue anybody for anything. I mean, you can sue the sun for, for rising in the morning if that's what you want to do. The question really is uh, going to be, uh, is the claim going to be successful? And the answer to that will depend on the circumstances. So. One of the things you could do is enter into some kind of um, a domestic agreement with your spouse as well, whereby you both agree that regardless of, of uh, what happens in the future, neither one of you will bring a claim against the other or against the estate of the other. So uh, that would be something that you could pursue as well. Okay. I think that's it. All right, well, I want to say a big thank you to Linda, first of all. I do see a few extra questions rolling in for her um, that we didn't get a chance to answer, so we can come back to those after the fact. Um, I will try and answer the last few that have come in for me briefly. I'm going to apologize off the start. There were two that came in that somehow vanished. We'll call that a tech issue. I did read them first, so I'm going to do my best to answer them um, first. If I don't answer it correctly, please send us your questions after the fact. We're happy to answer them. Uh, the first question that came in was regarding um, different types of assets, and the question said something to the effect of, it seems like the biggest liability for estates is RIFs and RSPs. Should we be sent spending that first? And that question really does depend. It's hard to say. We have to look at it on an individual basis. Yes, if you die with lots of money in your RSP, you have a tax bill. Um, however, you do not pay those taxes while you're alive. So if you live, there's the opposite side, right? So we have to balance what happens if you die prematurely with what if you don't? What if you live to your full life expectancy? And we can look at those numbers on an individual basis. Um, there was another question that came in again asking about how to set up different assets from a tax perspective and was there planning that could be done ahead of time my answer to that is there's always planning that can be done ahead of time i highly suggest you reach out we can look at things we're happy to provide a complimentary review after this for any specific questions that you have if you'd like us to look at specific accounts we can definitely do that for you um, with regards to other questions that have come through, more so for myself to answer, there was one here asking, is there anything to substantiate the rumor that the primary residence exemption may be taken away in light of our current coming financial predicament as a country with COVID? I hesitate to speculate on anything. I do know where that's coming from. There have been many articles um, written lately. More were spurred again in the fall when CMHC gave a $250,000 grant to a university to study that. However, CMHC does say that that is not indicative of an intention of having that taken away. The reality is tax rules can change at any given moment. They have proven this over uh, the course of history. They are able to change them. At this point, we have to do what's best with, with the knowledge we have now. And again, that's why it's really important to update your plan and look at things as you go. Make sure that you are updating laws change, rules change, circumstances change. As we've all seen lately, life can change pretty darn quickly. So it's important to make sure that you're updating and you're reviewing that. Um, I think the last question I have here specifically for me would be, does the value of the primary residence get included in the estate's income tax return? So when you file your tax return, um, the value of the, of the primary residence is not taxable. So it would be in probate, the little taxes we talk about, but it would not be part a taxable portion from an income tax return on a final return. Whichever residence you choose to deem as your primary residence, you do get to choose which residence within rules. Some people choose a cottage that they live at, you know, a couple months of the year, whichever option you do choose. And we're happy to walk through some of the circumstances with that with you is not included as taxable income. One thing to keep in mind though, is just because you live in a residence for a period of time, it is not your primary residence for the amount of time you have it. We hear time and time again that I'm going to sell my house 
move into my camp for three years, and then I won't ever have to pay tax on any of those gains because my house was my primary residence. Now my camp is my primary residence. Um, the government has caught on to that. They will not let you get away with that trick. You can only have one primary residence at a time. So there is a formula for how to deal with people who change primary residences throughout the years. And again, that's something if you're looking for specifics, we're happy to um, go through with you in your particular circumstances. So I want to take this uh, opportunity to wrap things up, say a very large thank you to Linda. We really appreciate having her here. She is a wealth of knowledge and an expert that I know many people appreciate her answering questions. Again, if more questions roll in, we will reach out. Feel free to ask us any of those questions personally as well if you want to reach out to us. You can find us on Facebook. You can find us online. Our website is www.thekilgoregroup.com. You can reach me via email. My contact is all available there. We really do look forward to answering any questions you might have and hearing from you. So thank you so much for your time tonight and have a wonderful evening. Stay safe, stay healthy. Good night. Good night.